Hello there, I am Honor Kamis, back with episode 2 of my series Reviving Ceylon Tea. Today, let us see how Ceylon Tea started. When the name Ceylon is mentioned to a foreigner, his immediate thought jumps into Ceylon Tea. Such is the impact of Ceylon Tea, which has created on people and nations far and wide in the globe. That was one time. I hope it is coming back again. Unlike other stories, it is my intention to make these videos cover all the best tea factories and their surrounding areas which have consistently performed well in Sri Lanka's tea industry even though these factories have seen their good, bad or even ugly days over 150 years and yet producing the nation's largest single foreign exchange earner. Most of these factories are struggling to show what they could do to keep the taste buds of millions of tea drinkers over the world searching for the special quality generations have been tasting through Ceylon tea. I will try my best to highlight them as, as I move along. Unfortunately, my study had to be confined to about 20 odd such factories initially due to lack of time and money, ending up with top tea factories spanning major tea producing areas in the upcountry region of Sri Lanka which has become my only passion or obsession. In my attempt to visit events of the past and present, I came across many untold fascinating stories of people and machinery which shaped up the tea factory which produced the world-renowned name Ceylon Tea. In some places, I had to personify people who were involved with events connected with the manufacturing process to give a human touch to my story. Seldom seen with dealing with men and machines together. Unlike many other industries, Tea manufacture is not confined to a few men and materials, but it encompasses generations of culture, tradition, way of life, and day-to-day -day trials and tribulations of people as well as machines which shape up the end product. The tea gardens of Sri Lanka producing Ceylon tea are some of the most enchanting beautiful places in the world. It is here you see green as green can ever be and makes one wonder if you or she is in paradise on earth. History of Ceylon tea is indeed like a thriller. It had a modest beginning and passed through trial and error to become a major primary industry of the country. As nature shows us something has to die for something else to start life. A typical example here is how death of coffee brought about birth of Ceylon tea. Yes, it is the death of coffee which brought about birth of Ceylon tea. In the year 1871, the first mention of the coffee leaf disease termed Hemilia vestatrix has been mentioned in the year 1871 in Ferguson Ceylon Directive of 1871. And according to records, tea seeds from China was imported in the year 1824 and from Assam in 1839. The British brought the entire island of Ceylon in, into their control in 1815 and within a decade established huge coffee plantations throughout central regions. That is history. However, the days of coffee in Sri Lanka were numbered as within a few decades a coffee tea leaf infestation struck a death blow to the industry, thus giving way to something altogether new to this country. The coffee disease was first identified in Madul Sima area, that is in Madul, in 1869 and coffee estates failed to revive production. The timing could not have been better for tea to take root. It was James Taylor who started the first tea industry in Ceylon by starting a tea plantation in Lul Kandara estate near Kandy in 1867. He started a fully equipped tea factory in 1872 in the same estate. The first sale of Lulkandara tea was made in Candil that year. The first shipment of Ceylon tea of a consignment of 10 kg or about 23 pounds arrived in London in 1873. More areas were brought into tea cultivation thereafter. Estates like Hope, Rookwood and Mulloya in Hewahete district and Levelland and Stellenberg at Puparasa began transforming into tea plantations and were among the first tea estates to be established on the island. When I mention hope, hope is one of the first states, I think it is a place of no hope as far as tea is concerned today. With half the estate gone under village expansion and balanced under a government body looks like the estate looks less healthy than most other estates. Unfortunately, none of these estates mentioned here have top class tea factories as of today and naturally I have to avoid visiting them for my specific work. Black tea has been the most popular among all teas produced in the world 
for over a century. In black tea processing, the plucked leaves are withered to reduce the moisture content approximately by 50%. The leaves are then rolled by mechanical tea rollers to macerate and break them into parts. This process of breaking up the leaves starts a series of chemical reactions that are catalyzed by the enzymes in the leaf. Tea is a very hardy plant and can be grown in many parts of the world where the climate is wet and warm with a minimum rainfall of 60 inches per annum provided it is evenly distributed through the year. However, the best climate for black tea growing in, on a commercial basis economically is the one which is hot and moist where the temperature in the shade does not exceed 95 degrees Fahrenheit and does not fall below 55 degrees F and where an evenly distributed annual rainfall is between 100 and 130 inches. Long period of drought is not conducive to tea. Due to the island's proximity to the equator, the, the mean temperature of Sri Lanka's tea growing areas vary from approximately 60 to 80 degrees F. Although in Sri Lanka there are no well-marked seasons, there are periodic changes in the climate influenced by the monsoon winds. Perhaps due to the recent global warming phenomenon, the entire country is experiencing longer periods of rain or sometimes prolonged drought. However, this has not seriously affected the country's tea production. Here are some common facts about Ceylon tea which the world may not be aware of. More than 80% of the tea plantations were owned by the British company since 1867 until they were nationalized by the government of Sri Lanka under a Land Reform Act in 1971. Under the first Land Reform Commission Act, the government took over all sterling registered tea estates started by the British a century ago. With another sweeping move, all other estates under Rupee Company were also nationalized by the then socialist government leaving most of the tea plantations in the hands of the state. Two major statutory boards, namely Sri Lanka State Plantations Corporation or SLSPC and Janata Estates Development Board or JDV, commenced total administrative control of most tea estates. The plantations have since been privatized and now run by regional plant plantation companies RPC and the RPC own a few estates each. The sec Tea sector in Sri Lanka has always been a most vital component of the economy and also the island's largest employer providing employment directly or indirectly to over a million people. This is why Ceylon tea has to be revived. Ceylon tea is in, in doldrum really because of the recent fertilizer problem. Globally, Sri Lanka is the third biggest black tea producing country next to India and China. Tea is produced throughout the year in Sri Lanka. The growing areas are high ground in, in elevation from 1200 meters upward, then medium ground covering between 600 to 1200 meters and low ground from sea level up to 600 meters. High ground teas are reputed for the aroma, quality and taste. That is why teas from Dimbul and Urele area are uh, much sought after by blenders in tea importing countries. The eastern highlands of Sri Lanka called the Uwa region produces teas of unique seasonal characters. They are widely used in blends particularly in Germany and Japan. The medium grown teas with their thick colorful experience are popular in uh, Australia, Europe, Japan uh, and North America. Low grown teas are popular in West Asia, Middle East and Eastern Europe. These teas are of leafy grade where tea leaves are well twisted and can grade into long particles. According to known history, it is believed tea originated in the Yunnan province of China and the plant was introduced to other countries from here. The people here believed that eating tea leaves or brewing a cup could be pleasant. Camellia sinensis is the botanical term for the tea plant. The first public auction of tea was held in 1883 in Colombo. Sri Lanka became the largest tea exporter in the world in 1965. Let us see how Ceylon tea was attempted before James Taylor. Studies of Ceylon tea history indicate in the mid or late 1700s, 
attempts were made to grow Ceylon tea in Ceylon. They were made by the Dutch who ruled large parts of Ceylon during that period as they could not find tea and some other elegant aromatics in the island. They made some trials to grow some species of, of China teas without success. In 1826, some natives thought they had the tea plant but it was later identified to be Cassia auriculata, popularly known as Ranavara by the natives. The leaves are similar to tea leaves and consumed after infusing in water just like tea. In 1839, Dr. Wallish, head of the botan botanical garden in Calcutta, sent several Assam tea plant seeds to the Peradeni estates in the Kandy district. Seeds of Chinese tea plant brought to Sri Lanka by travelers such as Morris de Worms were also planted in the Peradeniya nurseries, although these yielded disappointing results. And Chinese plants were gradually abandoned in favor of the Assam variety that is now grown on every estate in Sri Lanka. Of course, they have been mostly replaced with the VP cuttings, which is a hybrid of so many good varieties. These early arrivals were largely ignored for the more lucrative coffee, coffee craze that had seized the region. Later, in the 1840s, cutting seed and seedlings from the Chinese point of Yunnan from the subspecies known as Yunnan were brought to Ceylon. These were planted in the Pusalava growing districts of Ceylon. These Chinese tea beginnings were the tea on the tea plantations in Labukala group situated near Nuarelia during the same 1840s time frame. The Dimbula tea growing district was open to tea production. Now, from where do I start? When I started working on this project, I knew I would have to travel thousands of kilometers across the length of falling tea gardens in the hill country region of Sri Lanka and also a few plantations in the Uwa region. It is not going to be an easy task, but nevertheless, I would have to try and accomplish it. I knew there could be plenty of problems in obtaining permission from authorities who have direct control over this land. The roads could be bad even if they exist they could prove to be treacherous. There are hundreds of tea factories in the Central Highland, the Uwa region and in the southern parts of Sri Lanka. Most of these factories are situated in breathtakingly beautiful landscape surrounded by serene green gardens of tea. A casual tourist in this, to this island cannot call his visit complete if he does not pay a visit to at least some of them. Visitors to any of these centers are normally treated with typical Sri Lankan courtesy and normally given an educated guided tour on the various stages of tea manufacturing process. Never can anyone see such contrasting but breathtakingly beautiful places where these factories are located within a short period of time. My videos uh, I will try to cover all the important factories uh, but due to limited space, my own resources and time. I had to confine to as minimum as possible. Hence the reason I have selected only some of the best known tea factories in upcountry and over regions of Sri Lanka. It is left to my viewers to choose which factories they would like to visit in their own if they ever wish to. These places are mostly motorable and conveniently located though the condition of roads could be something else. Also I must admit some factor factories do not normally encourage tourists. Thank you and see you in the, my next video.